I'm Giovanna Pineda, Assistant Professor of History, and you're listening to the Richest Documentary Podcast. Welcome to the Riches Documentary Podcast. Riches, the regional initiative for collecting the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, is an umbrella program housing interdisciplinary public history projects that bring together different departments at the University of Central Florida with profit and nonprofit sectors of the community in order to promote the collection and preservation of the region's history. By facilitating research that records and presents the stories of communities, businesses, and institutions in Central Florida, Riches seeks to provide the region with a deeper sense of its heritage. Heritage. This series will feature a podcast every two weeks, in the middle and at the end of each month, that will explore various aspects of Central Florida history. In today's episode, The Winter Park Sinkhole, The Effects and Aftermath, Clayton Phillip looks at the recovery effort and the consequences of the 1981 natural disaster. Hello, you are listening to a history of the Winter Park sinkhole, about the issues surrounding the sinkhole disaster that occurred in the city of Winter Park, Florida between May 8th and May 10th of 1981. The impact of the Winter Park sinkhole was felt for years after the crater had stabilized and the recovery or reconstruction projects had begun. In particular was the discussion about property insurance laws and what was to be done with the area damaged by the sinkhole. In this podcast, we will be talking with Ronald Moore, Assistant Director for the City of Winter Park, Parks and Recreation Department. We will also be adding comments from various business owners near the sinkhole and be speaking with Dr. Kuyava of the University of Central Florida. We will begin by allowing our first guest to go ahead and introduce himself. Well, my name is Ronald Moore, and uh, I'm a resident of Winter Park, and I'm presently the Assistant Parks and Rec Director uh, for the City of Winter Park. I've been um, working for the city about uh, 33 years, um, and at one time I was a uh, program manager of uh, the community center, and I oversaw the uh, aquatics program, the swimming pools, and the swimming program. The Winter Park sinkhole would open up in an area adjacent to Denning Drive and Fairbanks Avenue. We asked Mr. Moore to describe the area before the sinkhole and include an explanation of park facilities in the area. Well, before the sinkhole, um, see at that time we had some softball fields there, uh, the swimming pool, uh, Lake Island Recreation Center. It was uh, a recreation facility. It was a residential area that uh, adjoined it, it was Comstock, uh, ran up to Hopper. So there were, str- there were homes uh, on the left-hand side uh, butting up to the park. On May 8, 1981, Miss May Rose Owens called to report that a tree in her yard had fallen into a developing hole. What soon followed over the next three days was a developing crater that ended up measuring over 300 feet across and over 100 feet deep. We asked local business manager Alan Duckworth to describe what he saw when he first encountered the sinkhole. Well, it, it actually seemed small at the time. You, know, you just kind of thought it wasn't going to be that big, you know. Um, and you, as it progressed, you could see on one side where it was very round. On the other side, it seemed very chopped off, and I think that that was just because of the foundations of the buildings that were there that were crumbling. 
Um, and, and then when you see the aerial views of it, you look at it and, and kind of come to the realization that you know, most sinkholes will eventually round themselves out. It didn't round itself out. And you just got to wonder whether that might still happen. Uh, but um, because of the foundations and the buildings that were over there, it just kind of stopped it on that one side short of rounding out. We all thought that it was just going to swallow up Fairbanks Avenue uh, there about halfway <laughs> down the street. And, uh, you know, they were going to have to reroute all these businesses. We asked Dr. Kuyava of the University of Central Florida about the process by which you would go about attempting to recover an area that had been affected by a sinkhole. Depends on the size of the sinkhole. If it's a fairly small one, usually there'd be uh, some way of sealing the uh, opening to any cavities that are down there, perhaps even filling the cavities with a type of cement called grout. Although if it's done improperly, sometimes it'll make the sinkhole larger beforehand. <laughs> so it usually takes a, an engineer to be able to properly set that up. But if it's a very large sinkhole, then it would take a huge amount of material. And then th another problem is that we don't often know exactly what's down below the surface. We can use ground penetrating radar to get to maybe 50 to 70 feet down, but that's usually just in the loose material. What's actually happening in the limestone, particularly in a place like the Winter Park area where the limestone is 160 feet down, uh, it be diff the only way to tell whether there's a cavity is by drilling which is very expensive and uh, the problem with drilling is that you can be three feet off of a major s depression and still not find it. In fact uh, there's a, a couple examples up in Tallahassee where just that sort of thing happened. After the initial days of the disaster were over, recovery plans began. Mr. Moore describes the process from the city of Winter Park's viewpoint. Well the, ne the neat thing about it for a year or so it was really very little we could do because the um, mother nature had taken over and we just had to kind of sit and wait and sit and wait they they initially was able to um, because it did take a part of denning initially uh, they were able to rebuild uh, the ground in that area and uh, open denning back up uh, but then the rest of it we had to kind of just wait until the the soil settled and my understanding is you know it was it's an underground tunnel and they tried to fill it uh with concrete and you know because of it being an underground tunnel they couldn't seal at the bottom so it was years uh, that nothing happened but it remained a hole with some water in it and over the years it, it began to fill up and it turned into a lake and the city kind of graded it and smoothed it out and then we redesigned the park. Dr. Kuyaba of the University of Central Florida describes the initial attempts of recovery by the individual business owners in the area and eventually the recovery effort of the city of Winter Park itself. Well before even recovering anything uh, the owner of the dry cleaners on the corner there of uh, Denning and Fairbanks had several loads of uh, sand dumped in to try to stabilize the, the wall there. And uh, at first it looked like it, was, it wasn't actually having much effect, but in retrospect it probably did help to protect this property. Then uh, the next to actually try true recovery was Lou Montessi, who owned a pawn shop across the street and bought up some of the properties on the Winter Park sinkhole. Had uh, opened the, his property to construction companies that were trying to get rid of construction debris, particularly uh, from tearing up roads or demolishing old buildings. That was cheaper for them to truck the things to the sinkhole and dump it rather than go miles out of the city and pay to, to dump it. So they would just back up and dump this material into the hole and as uh, more and more was dumped in, the, uh, the new trucks would be riding over some of the fill from the old trucks and packing it down. And, and eventually uh, he reclaimed quite a bit in the southwest uh, corner of the uh, sinkhole. Next, the city uh, decided to bring in an engineer and, and do it right to, in order to uh, stabilize Denning Drive, which had been cut by the sinkhole 
about a day after the major opening. Engineering firm, I believe it was Jamal and Associates, built a ramp that went across the center of the sinkhole, shored up Denning, and then they reconstructed the the road, and it uh, held pretty well even during a, a subsequent collapse. In the course of our interviews, a colorful character emerged in this story. Lou Montessi, a business owner on Fairbanks Avenue, began to appropriate property around the sinkhole and began his own recovery efforts. Fellow business owner Daryl Donkel explains. Well, Lou was right next door to me, and uh, Lou saw it as a capital gain for himself. You know, he went right across the street, and before you know it, he bought the piece of property adjacent to the, uh, right next to the laundromat there, which was on the corner. Imperial Laundry has been there for the beginning of time. He was able to purchase that for like $10,000. And then he was able to purchase a couple of more pieces as time went on Carl's piece. Uh, Lou had cash. And it took cash to be able to get out of those deals. Unfortunately, in my position, I didn't have cash, not enough cash anyhow, <clears throat> but we had credit. So I was able to assume someone else's loan on the piece on the other side. That's how we were able to purchase our piece over there. So we didn't buy it as cheap as Lou did. Lou bought it cheap. We just bought it with terms. Uh, we paid a lot more money. Uh, matter of fact, Lou got, it, it changed Lou's life a lot. It, it actually, I think it um, kind of devastated him. It affected his family life. It affected everything. It was like a, he, he got so excited about the, the, the goal. He, he just, everything he did, he, leave, he lived and breathed the sinkhole. I mean, he worked every day. I would come in there and I'd see him working at 6 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. I'd see him working at 8, 9 o'clock at night trying to develop the buildings, put the back walls in it, fill the back. And... Uh, it, sometimes it, you learn something from something like that. It, it really, I think it hurt Lou Montana, Lou Montez a lot. But it was something he truly enjoyed and he had a real, real true desire to make it happen. And he did. He made some good money on it. Um, what was kind of funny is that one time, I can remember, it was almost around Christmas time. It was about maybe five or six years, maybe seven years later. Might have been more than that. Time goes kind of fast. But uh, Lou had the property sold for a pretty substantial amount of money, eight hundred some thousand dollars, or maybe nine hundred thousand. Back then, that was a pretty lot of money. The sinkhole just kind of flushed like a toilet. The water disappeared. It just went. Whoop. And uh, needless to say, the people who were going to purchase it chose not to purchase it. So he got a lot less money for it when he did sell it. And the water, of course, came back up again, like as it is today. But uh, it was pretty shocking. It was like it was just like someone just opened it up and the water disappeared. And that happened uh, right around Christmas one year. As the city of Winter Park quarantined the area, individual business owners began to look for solutions. Some became dismayed at government responses and the lack of their own insurance coverage. Business owner Dennis Phillips explains. Where it happened, um, the whole area on the, on the north side of Fairbanks Avenue was all fenced off with a giant hurricane fence and lots of, of, of caution signs and so forth. The police actually maintained a watch there for at least a month with a patrol car. They also installed some, some high power lights up on the, on the power poles they, that they turned on, that they kept on almost, uh, well, 24 hours, well, and when it got dark. And uh, I didn't know exactly what they were going to do. The, we had a meeting with one of the governor's assistants, and he said there's basically no financial aid. There's not much we can do. Uh, we did, there was no plans to do anything to it. I, I think the, the city of Winter Park just wanted to forget about it because they, they made no plans. Uh, so this gaping hole exists over there. And it, it included the, the back end of a dry cleaners, uh, the back end of a print shop, the parking lot and the back part of a uh, German car repair shop and a drapery shop that had lost the back end of their building. And I think nobody really quite knew what to do because nobody knew how they were going to pay for it. So the I didn't know exactly what they were going to do either. The next thing I know, uh, a guy that was a manager of a pawn shop next to me had decided he was going to make an emergency offer to the owners of the property there and just take it over, pick it up. And uh, his name was Lou Montessi. And Lou went over and he basically bought the property for, for relatively inexpensive Increasingly, the issue of insurance became a problem. Daryl Donkel explains his own recovery efforts and his own realization of the insurance question. Well, when I saw it, I mean, it was probably 
the size of a half a Kmart, okay? But as the day went on, it got larger and larger until it, Mrs. Rose's house had went in, the pool had went in, the Porsches went in. Um, it became pretty substantial as the day went on. I mean, it went so, so substantial that at one point in time, I thought I was covered with sinkhole insurance, which uh, only to find out it didn't cover commercial property. And when I found that out, at first I thought, well, you know, who needs a building and inventory if you don't have anywhere to display it? I said, we best just let it go in with it. What the heck? You don't get one check from the insurance company. But only to find out later on that the sinkhole coverage didn't cover, didn't cover commercial property. So I rushed right on down. We got a U-Haul and started loading that baby up about as fast as you could because it was getting a lot closer then. Time had changed a little bit. So um, it, it, it's an eye-opener for you. And back then, of course, I was much younger. You know, you're in the 20s and stuff like that. You're not sure how things are panning out. Florida state legislators got together and decided that, hey, listen, we need to seriously look at and evaluate whether or not we got to do something for commercial property owners. Of course, you know, they did it just to protect the insurance companies and to protect the people that are mortgage holders as well. I mean, face it, if you're holding a mortgage on a piece of commercial property and you find out it has no sinkhole coverage, well, you have to seriously think about whether you want to lend them money. So what they did basically was by changing it to pretty much what you have with residential property is that it, you're basically put in a pool and everybody pays X amount of dollars towards the whole pool and now everyone has commercial as well, commercial sinkhole coverage as well. Dr. Frank Cuyaba of the University of Central Florida explains the chronology of the change in insurance law and the impact the Winter Park sinkhole had on insurance coverage. About 15 years or so before the Winter Park sinkhole opened up, there was a spate of sinkhole activity in Central and uh, in Central Florida, particularly in Polk County. And in 1971, the Florida legislature required that uh, a rider be available to homeowners for an extra premium uh, that would cover sinkhole damage. And therefore, the legislature had uh, required that sinkhole coverage be added to homeowners' policies, or at least the possibility uh, that would cover sinkhole damage. After the Winter Park sinkhole developed, Insurance Commissioner Bill Gunter uh, prevailed on the insurance companies to remove the extra premium and just make it an automatic part of the policy because he pointed out that two million dollars had been collected in premiums and not a single claim had been paid. Alan Duckworth gives his take on the situation. There was always a there was always a lot of um, fussing. It seemed like because people wanted to wanted somebody to be responsible for the damage. So, you know, usually you were hearing stories like that where people wanted to sue the city and the city's saying it's not their fault. And, you know, uh, there was a lot of finger pointing. But um, the bottom line was it was a big hole, <laughs> big hole, and stuff fell in it. Some people did well because of it. Some people did not. And, uh, and, and it's an interesting part of uh, Winter Park history now. Regardless of the insurance problem, the area must be rebuilt. Mr. Moore describes the city of Winter Park's plans and the eventual conversion of the area into a park. No, it was it was very interesting uh, to go through the process and the, um, you know to it it brought the community together in in a whole lot of ways because people came out and embraced and it, it got a lot of media and um, you know the city did build the new swimming pool, removed the pool next to the uh, community center at that time so it, it wasn't like and then we redesigned it that that area to where um uh there are all-purpose fields there it, we took and moved the softball fields out to katie way and put them together we used to have one on this side and one on the other side well by putting them together you know it does embrace having a better tournament so uh, it is a very nice complex now it's like the lake, which is a sinkhole. So many people don't even know. One of the firemen, uh, Mr. Walter, he did a board years ago, the weather damage it, but he took it upon himself to do a board with pictures and, you know, the whole process so that when people walked around the park, they could see it. But it, it was, I, I embrace man, it's a real nice park now that we use very much so. so. You have been listening to a history of the Winter Park sinkhole. 
Thank you for listening to this program, and a special thanks goes to our guests. For more information on today's subject, please refer to The Winter Park Sinkhole, a report to the City of Winter Park, by Jamal Associates, Incorporated Consulting Geotechnical Engineers, published in 1982. Special thanks goes to Dave Sirak and WFTV Channel 9, news for archival research and audio-video contributions. Also special thanks goes to Dr. Frank Kuyava of the University of Central Florida and Ronald Moore of the Winter Park. Thank you for listening to the Richest Documentary Podcast. Feel free to contact us with any questions or comments on the program that you just heard. Please join us for the next episode, Volusia County Railroad History, an interview with Seth Brandt.